James Albury and Dean Regas. Welcome to Neve, guys. Thank you very much. Welcome. Welcome, guys. Ah, well, good evening, or oh. good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, oh. Thank you very much for having us here today. Uh, my name is Dean Regis. Uh, this is James Albury, uh, and we are the co-hosts of the TV show Stargazers. Um, let's see, out of curiosity, uh, how many of you guys watch us uh, regularly? Uh-oh. All right. We're in trouble. I know. <laughs> All right, we're going to have to How do some explaining. Regularly. That's right. Well, yeah. well anyway, uh, well, the show that we're on this, we're on a PBS show uh, called Stargazers. This is broadcast all around the country. Uh, and uh, we give one minute and five minute segments about what's up in the sky. And uh, this is our great graphics behind us. As you can tell, we fly through space on hoverboards. <laughs> Very exciting stuff. Um, well, uh, James, we'll let you introduce yourself a little bit and uh, your background with this. Okay. Well. As again, my name is James Albert, and I work at the Kika Silva Pla Planetarium. And when I first started working there, the last name Pla is the first three letters of planetarium. I said, was that a typo? <laughs> but to see the, the Pla family, they donated money to have the planetarium completed. So uh, it is interesting the planetarium has such an interesting uh, name that rolls trippingly off the tongue. <laughs> But um, nevertheless, I started working in the field of astronomy and in planetariums when I was 14 years old down in Miami at the Miami Space Transit Planetarium, because apparently they didn't have child labor laws back in the 80s. But <laughs> anyway, um, while I was working there, I had the opportunity of working with Jack Horkheimer, who was the creator and original host for the Star Hustler program. And we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the show as we go. But I really enjoyed not only working in that environment, but also sharing my love of astronomy with all the people who would visit. So I said, you know, when I grow up, I think I am going to go ahead and work in a planetarium. So when I went to the University of Florida, I studied astronomy. And when I graduated, I said, well, hmm, there are no astronomy jobs readily available, so I'll go into computer science. So I did that for a while. Then eventually I met my wife, uh, who I was helping with her electronic uh, thesis at the time. And we eventually got married, and then when we were moving from the Jacksonville area back to Gainesville, she said, you know, Gainesville has a planetarium now, and didn't you work in a planetarium when you were in high school and uh, early part of college? And I said, yeah, but eh, I don't know. Well, she said, go ahead and look at the job description. So I looked at the job description and said, oh, I can do that. I've done that. I can do that. Oh, well, let me go ahead and apply. And I applied. They liked me, and now I've been the director there for almost eight years now. I've produced several planetarium shows, and, and now I get to co-host the show that I used to watch when I was a little kid, and now my son watches me on the show. So that's, it's kind of trippy now that you realize that a lot of things come full circle <laughs> as they do. And as when a, in there, when in there was your bodybuilding career? Oh, that was, <laughs> I was, I was competing in bodybuilding right when I met my wife, which is interesting. Uh, I met her two weeks before I competed in the Gainesville bodybuilding competition. I won the competition. I invited her to the competition and I ended up winning. So I was like, well, that's good fortune. <laughs> yeah, before and I met James, uh, when we were about to be named co-hosts, uh, before I met him, uh, my colleague was like, have you Googled James Albury? And I did, <laughs> and the first picture was him like, I mean, this is like, it, do it, do it, you should well, do it. Well, I don't want to mess up the Yeah, microphone. I don't want to break the suit, but I mean, it, it's, it, if you want to have fun, look, Google James Albury bodybuilding, uh, you'll, you'll be, you'll, oh dear. It's, it's impressive, it's impressive. <laughs> well, thank you. Sure. And uh, so uh, this is uh, your planetarium, uh, and a lot of people wonder when you say you're at Santa Fe College, you're not in Santa Fe, New Mexico, right? right. Yeah, we often get that, because uh, there's a river near Alachua County in, Gaines in Florida. Uh, it's called the Santa Fe River. So when Santa Fe College was, or Santa Fe Community College was started 50 years ago, they called it Santa Fe Community College, but there's also a Santa Fe Community College in uh, New Mexico. So that produced a problem when we had our planetarium, because I occasionally, to this day, get phone calls from people trying to make reservations for the Santa Fe College Planetarium, Santa Fe Community College Planetarium, uh, and they're calling from New Mexico or uh, places nearby. I said, well, that's a 2,000 mile commute. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's but, a long way to go. Yeah, that's why, fortunately, when uh, John Pla and his wife Amy Howard donated the money to the planetarium, we have the other name, Kika Silva Pla, rather than the Santa Fe College Planetarium. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and, uh, and my name is Dean Regas. I'm the astronomer at the Cincinnati Observatory, uh, and I've been there since 2000. Uh, just last year, I wrote a book called Facts from Space, 
Uh, it has about 850 facts about everything in outer space, uh, stars, planets, all sorts of stuff. It's a good starter, a good reader uh, that you can pick up anywhere. Uh, some of our uh, uh, local radio uh, personalities said, this is the perfect toilet book. This is perfect. <laughs> when you're sitting on the toilet, you know, I don't know, we'll go with that. Anyway, uh, we'll have, uh, James and I will be out uh, at the side, uh, and I'll have these for sale. I'll be happy to sign some of these, and James has some postcards to sign with his headshot, so you can get, not the bodybuilding one, so, but no. well, that's us. <laughs> anyway, uh, and then I also work at the Cincinnati Observatory. This is a historic observatory in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, we have uh, two telescopes. Our new telescope is a 16-inch Alvin Clark uh, and Sons from 1904. That's our new one. The old one is our uh, pride and joy, one of the oldest telescopes in the world. Uh, made in 1843 in Munich, Germany, saw first light 1845. So it's going to have its 172nd birthday uh, on uh, Friday, so a week uh, next Friday. So definitely love to have you guys come and visit us uh, either in Gainesville or, or in Cincinnati. Uh, so the show, how the show got started, well, this was something that uh, goes back a long way uh, to when Jack Horkheimer started it. And so Jack Horkheimer, there he is. Uh, this hey. is, uh, Jack Horkheimer was the one who started the show. It was originally called Star Hustler. And so maybe you recognize that name. Now, uh, why would you have to change the name from Star Hustler to something? Anybody? Uh, I don't know. If you, uh, <laughs> that's another thing to Google. Uh, other yeah. than James Bodybuilding, <laughs> look up. Anyway. Yeah. If, uh, yeah. So, one so, of, yeah, one of the challenges, would you like me to tell the story? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, one of the challenges as, because uh, Star Hustler started back in 1976, and eventually uh, the show went national in the mid-'80s. So when the internet came along, often teachers would like to show the episodes to the students, so they would do a search for Star Hustler, but when you search Hustler on Google, you don't get... Well, you did, it wasn't as family friendly anymore. So, <laughs> you got something. You yeah. got something. That's true. Yeah. So when Jack was talking to the producers of the show, he said, well, we need to change the name. And one of the producers, Ed Waglin, said with Jack's advancing age, we should change the name from Star Hustler to Star Geezer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 Geezer's, even though he likes it, Gazer would be better. So um, Star Gazer's, Star Gazer, Jack Horkheimer Star Gazer is the name that it eventually went to. And then the manifestation of it today, we have Star Gazers, plural, because there's two of us. And there were originally three of us. Right. Um, Marlene Hidalgo, one of the science teachers from Miami, when in October 2011 it was announced that we would uh, revamp the show a little bit and have three hosts. She was our third host. But actually, she moved to this area. That's right. That's so right. She was, uh, because she was so far away, she wasn't able to do the show anymore with us. But Well, yeah, so but my memory of, of seeing the first time I saw Jack uh, on TV was, I mean, I was really little. And I was watching it. And it, it was always on at the last thing that PBS did. So it was right before the, sh the station called it called a night. So why I was up at 12 at night, I don't know. Uh, but I was watching, I was like, boy, this guy's a little out there. I mean, he has this zany, can you do the voice? Greetings, greetings, stargazers. There we well, go. Kind of. <laughs> and I haven't heard the music on my cell phone that was on the, the show, but we'll talk about that. And he was always wearing this, uh, the jacket. Members only jacket. The members yeah. only jacket. And uh, so he's this kind of casual guy. And, and the other thing that, well, I mean, he's got a lot of uh, claims to fame. Jack Foley Horkheimer is his full name. Uh, and he was mostly into acting and, and theater and initially, and then found astronomy as kind of a, his love. And he was just this great popularizer. He really got people's attention. Uh, and James met him uh, several times oh, yeah. at least, yeah. right? Because yeah, he was your boss, and yes, essentially. he was my boss. <laughs> and one of the interesting things, you notice the picture of Jack there, he's wearing his uh, famous toupee. Uh, but at work, he never wore the toupee. And we're saying, why is he wearing the toupee? Is he vain about his, you know, <laughs> disappearing hairline. And it turns out uh, that back in those days, they had, were initially, when they started doing the show Star Hustler and then Stargazers, they had a practical set where you had planets and a moonbeam that Jack would walk in on. However, with the advent of technology, uh, the advance of technology, they were able to do green screen technology. The problem is that chroma key, the technology they used for green screening, was not as sophisticated as it is today. And in trying to key out everything that was not green, they also, the reflection off the top of his head was disappearing. So, or at least it was making the top of his head disappear. So rather than him wearing a hat, they said, oh, well, maybe you can wear a toupee. 
So I told my dad this story, and he said, well, goodness, you're completely bald. How, do you want to wear mom's wig or something like that when you go on TV? <laughs> I said, no, 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 they've taken care of it. Although um, when we put makeup on, I also have to put makeup on the top of my head so that I don't glisten too much. And I said, hmm, this looks like Martian dust. Maybe I can get a, a, a face painter to paint Mars on the back of my head, <laughs> the Tharsis Ridge, or maybe the, uh, <laughs> the uh, Valles Marineris or something like that. Yeah, I mean, that's what they said, because that was one of the first questions I asked when I went in to, to they said, well, why, you know, what was he wearing the toupee for? I said, oh, well, yeah, because his head just disappeared. It was very disturbing to see just eyes and a, like, cavity where his head was, <laughs> and, and stars coming out of it. Not, not really uh, the best thing. Um, so Jack, uh, Jack passed away in uh, 2010, mm -hmm. summer 2010, August, yeah. and um, so we were, uh, James and I are both watching, and we, you know, James is living in Gainesville, and I was in Cincinnati, and we were wondering what are they going to do with the show? Are they going to continue it after all these years? And so uh, the first person we saw right after uh, Jack was a guy named Chris Trigg who worked for, uh, was it the Science Center yeah, there? He worked for the Science Center. And, and it was kind of just like called into service, said, okay, we need somebody to, to fill in. And, and, you're, and you're not hideous looking. That's so. right. <laughs> and they brought Chris in, and he did a really good job. I thought uh, he was, he was <laughs> yeah. pretty sharp. And, um, and so then I said, well, okay, I guess they're going to continue the show. And somebody asked me, so, well, why don't you see what they're doing? Are they going to have new hosts or what's going to happen? And, and so I called up the station. I said, what are you guys, uh, are you taking any uh, tryouts? And they said, actually, uh, Chris doesn't want to do it. How about you come down right now? <laughs> I was like, oh, well, I felt it's kind of privileged. They didn't know who I was, but there I was somebody. So that worked out. <laughs> so I went down for my first uh, episode, and I got to sit on the rings of Saturn just like Jack and swing my legs and all this stuff and get burnt by Antares and Deneb and all sorts <laughs> of stuff, and you flip around all over the place. So uh, by the way, how do you think that we sit on the rings? Anybody? Yeah, what do you think? Not CGI. Come on, we're talking like '70s technology here. <laughs> exactly. It's green screen, and it is a green chair. Yeah. The so we're sitting chair on a green, green chair. It is. It's, it's. Yeah. It's high tech stuff. So that was my first time, and when when I. When I did this the first month, I, I, we, filmed, we used to film one month of shows at a time. And I, I thought, man, I really bombed. I felt like I had like deer in the headlights. I was like, all oh, these lights. I, you're reading from a teleprompter, all this stuff. And I went after, after the, the first taping, I was like, well, I guess that was it. I'll go home to Cincinnati. And that was it. And they said, well, you know, we'll give you a C plus. Um, but you know, how about we will come back next month? I said, oh, sure. So I, I got the call back and did another month. Uh, and then they tried a few other hosts as well. We had uh, Ed Romano uh, did, I think, one month. He mm -hmm. had the, uh, the one-month stint I that Ed did. I think he's from this area also. Yeah, that's right. That's mm -hmm. right. Uh, and, then, uh, and then they called in this guy. <laughs> oh, dear. Look at that young guy there. Look at that uh, clean-shaven yeah, face. Uh, bright eyed. Hair. He was, you know, he comes in the first day with a tie on. And I was like, oh my goodness, who is this guy? And uh, so, uh, yeah, tell about your first, uh, your first yeah, time. So, so I didn't, you know, I, I was thinking maybe do I need to wear a members only jacket like Jack did? <laughs> and I said, no, well, I'll just dress the way I do at work. So I wore a tie because, you know, my wife would you say, you wear You're a tie at work? Uh, yeah. Oh my gosh, I, I don't even know you. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, but, um, Anyway, with the, uh, when, you know, when you're on national television, your wife says, you're not going to be on television embarrassing the family. And mom calls me up, says the same thing. It's like, OK, I'll wear a tie. <laughs> so when I get there, the producers say, wow, you're kind of overdressed. It's like, next time you can, you can dress like this now. But I think I wore jeans casual. on mine, actually. Yeah. So that's how, anyway. <laughs> yeah. so, so in the first episode, we did, uh, I went down during the spring break at Santa Fe College, which was helpful because I had the whole week off. So I went down there. And we taped the episodes for the month of April. And one of my favorite episodes is we were talking about the Summer Triangle and so forth. And uh, they, at that time, they did the special effects at the same time we were recording. So it took a lot longer to do that because that's what Jack insisted on. He wanted to see what the final f product would look like as they were recording it, which made it a lot harder to do. Um, but we did it. So uh, they were actually able to have me spin in on the rings and land, and I would react as they were flying me in. So if you go back in YouTube and look at my original episode from April of 2011, 
you'll see when they spin me in on the rings, I actually react when I land, which is kind of cool. Yeah, you were good at that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we don't do it anymore. Like you're purchase. flipping through space. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, you'll have to tell the story about the people who called you asking whether we were okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so that's the thing is that I asked the, the, the film crews, like, so did, tell me some, some good Jack stories. And the one that the, the cameraman, uh, Keith, told me was that, you know, that there are people that really believed we were in space. They really thought we went to space just to film this one minute show and to say hi. And uh, so Jack Horkheimer got a, a fan that came up to him at one of the conferences like this. And it was this uh, kind of older lady and she comes up to him and she said, oh my gosh, I'm so glad to meet you, Mr. Horkheimer. I'm just, I've, every time I see you, I'm just afraid that you're gonna be lost in space. I, you know, they're throwing you around up there. I'm just so glad that you're okay. <laughs> and she's like, he's like, yes, uh, thank you. I'm on, on Earth all the time, but, <laughs> but it, yeah. I don't know if the graphics can fool people, but I guess maybe yeah. they can, I don't know. Uh, yeah. So, so then uh, we also tried out another uh, co-host, Marlene Hidalgo. Uh, she was a science teacher in Miami, Florida, and so for, uh, a little while, there was three of us, so we were the stargazers, James, myself, and, Mar and Marlene. And uh, so, uh, and she was with us for about a year or two, uh, something yeah, like that. Three years. Yeah. And uh, uh, so it was a lot of fun just, you know, kind of playing off each other and mm -hmm. flying through space and all sorts of things. And then uh, she moved up to, uh, I think, the New Jersey area, yeah, yeah, somewhere area. like mm -hmm. that, uh, a couple years ago. And, uh, but... Uh, this is kind of what the typical scene is. This is the green screen uh, that we film in front of. It's it's kind of like uh, you know what weather people do. Mm -hmm. and it's a very big green screen. And so this must be. Uh, oh, I'm pretending to be Orion, and James mm -hmm. is not impressed. But anyway, that's. Uh, <laughs> and so then they just fill in the magic of television behind, and you can have anything you want. You can be on Mars. You can be all sorts of places. Yeah, and we can't wear anything green. That's true, yeah, you can't wear anything green uh, or else you disappear completely into the background. Uh, so here's the three of us, and, uh, and this is uh, kind of the, the, the full setup there. This is, the, it's, a, it's filmed in WPBT2 Studios in North Miami, Florida. So uh, James drives down uh, from North Florida and I fly down from Cincinnati. And uh, so now we film two months of shows at a time. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, we write the scripts uh, for two months ahead of time, and luckily, astronomy is so predictable, yep. uh, we don't have any surprises. Except for comets. I know. Don't yeah. we need a comet, everybody? We mm. need a comet. Yeah, this we're is overdue. ridiculous. It's been 20 years. We need a comet. I'll write my congressman. And then we can have another trip to Florida. <laughs> yep. um, and so uh, there's James in his usual hamming it up pose. Um, the one thing that I've learned about him is uh, that he, well, let me think. Nerd is probably too weak of a word. Uh, he is uh, incredibly nerdy. I mean, like, uh, not only is your ringtone the Jack Horkheimer theme, like, yeah. whenever we're driving, he always has something spacey playing. Like, yeah. he's learning all the time about space stuff. And so, uh, if you guys meet us afterwards outside, uh, I do warn you, if you ask him a question, you will get the whole answer. Uh, that's for sure. So get ready for that. Well, thank you. <laughs> he also is uh, quite the dancer. Yes. Um, whenever we need to relax uh, and ease the tension, he's always doing so. What, what do you call that one? Uh, what, this one or I don't know, what, whatever you do. Well, whenever, yeah. we, whenever we talk about conjunctions, I start dancing. He has the conjunction I really dance. like conjunctions. Uh, and we, <laughs> we had one, uh, one uh, fan write in and said, uh, I'm, what's wrong with James? He's got ants in his pants. Does he have to pee or what is going on? So you might have to work on the dance a little. I don't know. It looks like you have to pee. But anyway, uh, so uh, one of the last things that Marlene did with us is that uh, in 2011, she and I went out to Reno, Nevada, and we did a, a show out there for uh, the eclipse. They had a lunar eclipse that was visible out there, and so we uh, joined with, uh, with the Reno uh, public uh, television and did a show out there, and so that was really fun. We're really excited about the other eclipse that's coming up, though. Yep. Uh, and so uh, what we're going to talk about next is we want to really, uh, you know, th the main part of uh, Stargazers is to get the public interested. We, we know we're not, like, uh, trying to teach, uh, you know, PhD astrophysics, that's for sure. We're trying to inspire people. We're trying to get people uh, maybe their first looks through telescopes. And so we want to get a few things to get you guys going. 
Uh, and just to give you a little bit of example of kind of what the shows are like, uh, we've got a couple clips here. This is going to kind of highlight some of the unbelievably realistic graphics that we have. And so let's see, could you guys start this one uh, for us? Is the bright nose of Canis Major, the big dog of Orion. And it's always kind of low in the southern sky from my latitude, but let's see the difference from down in Miami. When Dean comes from Miami to film stargazers, he's traveling down the curve of the Earth. So when he heads south, he gets to see stars that were blocked by his southern horizon in Cincinnati. For every one degree of latitude Dean goes south, he'll get to see one extra degree of the southern sky. All right, that had to be the worst acting job of walking ever. I mean, they didn't, they're like, oh yeah, that was good enough. I was like, that's terrible, that's terrible. Anyway, that's how I get to Florida as I walk down giant earth. Anyway, um, the next one is, uh, oh right, this is the secret the to secret James's to, haircut. To, uh, this yeah, is the good. secret to my start haircut. this one, please. The sun's output is the same all year round, but the difference in our seasons is how much of that energy we soak up. It has nothing to do with how close or far we are from the sun. We're closest to the sun every year in January and farthest from the sun in July. So the distance isn't the difference. Hey James, you staying cool? The sun is blasting off my hair. Oh, you're doing great, you're doing great. Now, let's see how our tilt affects the view from down on Earth. Uh, sorry about your hair. It's okay, it'll grow back. <laughs> and it hasn't. And it never did. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> All right. And uh, the next one, so we try to play off each other a little bit, and okay, so I'm kind of nerdy. I don't know. A little. Uh, who, who's the nerdier one? Mm. What's the orbital eccentricity of Mars? See, there we go. That's, okay. a, that's the answer to that question. <laughs> um, so this is, uh, we, I don't know if you all have, uh, some of you are from astronomy clubs and uh, have gone to conferences where you have a uh, constellation shootout where you sit in a planetarium and, and try to shoot out, the, try to name all the constellations and stars. Well, that's what we do. So if we could start this clip, this is our episode about that. Now we're facing south at 10.30 p.m. and we can see Orion high in the sky. Below him is the rabbit constellation called Lepus. Above Orion's right shoulder is Taurus the Bull. And to the right of Lepus is the constellation Aridnus. Okay, James, since you picked Orion, I challenge you to a star lightning round. Oh, goody. Okay, we're zoomed in on Orion and we're going to name stars. Go. Rigel. Bellatrix. Misa. Alnitak. Alnalam. Mintaka. Safe. Beetlejuice. Ah, good play, Mr. Regus. We could be here all night. I mean, it's kind of weird that we do a show where we talk about, like, obscure star names and, like, they still want us to do those. I yeah. mean, like, so we're, we're like just trying to sneak in education here wherever we can. Yep. And uh, so James is really good at uh, constellations. Yeah. So, uh, we, yeah, so we started doing the, uh, the couple of episodes, the one on Bootes, the herdsman that airs either next week or uh, sometime soon. We talk about the individual stars in those constellations. Because uh, I, uh, I'm the director of the planetarium in, in Gainesville, as it, as it were, and I'm also the president-elect for our region's uh, Planetarium Association. So we have, uh, at our conference, we have a constellation shootout where all of us gather in the planetarium and they set the projector to the latitude of the host planetarium and they just slowly cruise the stars by. And John Bell, who is the director of the planetarium at Indian River State College, he, he's my role model. He can tell you the name of a star that's so obscure, it's like, I didn't know that star had a name. So I wanted to be like him. So fortunately, at one of the conferences, they had the same planetarium projector that I have at my planetarium, a Godot Kronos. So having the set guy easily recognizable, because it goes down to about sixth magnitude, uh, the magnitudes of those stars on the Godot, um, I won that competition. And then the next time I competed, I won again, because thanks to you doing stargazers, I've learned all of my obscure star names, like Rastaban, which is one of my favorite names, and uh, Grafius and Deshuba. Um, so yeah, now I just judge the competition. I don't compete in it anymore. But it's that's too, one you're of too much of a ringer, right? Yeah. You can't, so uh, now, yeah, yeah. thanks to stargazers and working in a planetarium all the time, uh, and we'll talk more about uh, all the different shows that we do. But. Yeah. And our final clip is, um, okay, now this was an episode that I really lobbied for, that uh, this is one that I wanted to, I guess maybe in another life I wanted to be a stand-up comic. So uh, I asked, could we do a show just about moon jokes? Yep. So get ready for some bad jokes, if you could cue that one, please. <laughs> The 
long-awaited Moon Joke episode. Hey there, stargazers. I'm Dean Regas, astronomer from the Cincinnati Observatory. And I'm James Albury, director of the Kika Silva Plot Planetarium in Gainesville, Florida. We're here to help you find your way around the sky. And this week to share some space jokes, specifically about the moon, since you'll be able to see it after dark each night this week. Dean's been wanting to do this forever, so just humor him. We have some gems like what holds up the moon? What? Moon beams, of course. I've got a million of them. Well, more like five or six of them. And as we wax on about the moon and show you what's up in the sky, we know that your interest will not wane. Let's show you. So how does the moon cut his hair? I know, eclipse it. <laughs> One of the worst jokes ever. But that makes me think about eclipses. And although we had four total lunar eclipses in the last two years, we won't be having another one until January 31st, 2018. I hate waiting that long for an eclipse, so luckily there will be a solar eclipse before then. Mark your calendars for August 21st, 2017. That's when the new moon will slide in front of the sun and block part of it out. This eclipse will be easy to see across the entire lower 48 states. And if you happen to be in the right place at the right time, on a narrow path between Oregon and South Carolina, you can see a total solar eclipse. That's when the new moon blocks out the entire sun. Well, so that's just a little sampling of some of the shows that we do to get you guys excited about this. And um, I think what we really want to cover a lot about is, you know, how we can <laughs> all be part of this, how we can all be part of spreading the word about astronomy and science. And yeah. uh, this is one that James uh, shared with me. I loved it. Yeah. so Because uh, I, I found out in my travels that not everybody likes science. Uh, so this is, I, I love finding memes on the internet. So uh, to describe this one, uh, first, okay, we're not the center of the universe. Two, uh, once you believe in science, you feel that, okay, well, we can't prove God. And then third, there are no unicorns. <laughs> so, yeah. But, <laughs> but science is one thing, but astronomy. Yeah, astronomy, people love astronomy um, because at every level you can participate in astronomy. You can participate in it uh, and at one end where you're doing research and graduate work and other end you can actually be an amateur astronomer and just look up at the night sky and keep track of the things that are happening uh, every day in the night sky. So I often ask people uh, if you could describe astronomy in uh, one word, what word would you use? And some of the words that came up were, we're advancing much faster. Okay, I'm, I'm oh, sorry. Anything. Okay. Uh, beautiful, <laughs> mysterious, impressive. Uh, cool was the one that you submitted. Oh, I and did then, cool. Yeah, oh, and then right, right. inspiring and big, because uh, every you know everything in space is big, uh, and sometimes those distances and sizes are really tough to comprehend. Uh, but when you put it in a smaller scale, say for example, if you put the entire solar system in a coffee cup with the orbits of the planets included, our galaxy would be the size of North America on that scale. And so, if you think um, of you know anything that you see in the news, it it, it always it really struck me is that. Astro all astronomy stories are always positive. There's like no negative astronomy stories. It's, it's like there's always something new that's discovered. They discover uh, a galaxy or they discover uh, a planet orbiting around another star. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I don't know what it is. There's, there's no like downside. It's, it's like that we have this, uh, well, we have this, this conduit to the media mm -hmm. where the media yeah. loves these stories. They love sharing it with the public. And, and it, it's inspiring and it gives hope. I think and so. Because uh, I was inspired by Star Trek. And I used to watch Star Trek all the time. Oh, that'd be really cool to travel to different planets and visit. Uh, and then the space program. I grew up in the, I was born in the late 60s, so I was alive when we were sending people to the moon and so forth. So I remember seeing Saturn V launches as a kid. And that has, it's, has something, it sparks uh, an interest in people, and I'm hoping that you know once we get the Orion program moving and we start planning missions to the moon again and to Mars, it'll inspire a new generation. So that's one of the things that's a passion for me is to, with our planetarium and then you know with the observatory and the show Stargazers, that we can inspire young people to uh, think about traveling into space because we develop a lot of other technologies as spin-offs from space exploration. So uh, opportunities. So. With the challenges of getting people interested in astronomy, there are always opportunities in engaging them. And as many of you as amateur astronomers uh, know, 
They, oh, back up. Okay. Uh, so one, you can visit a planetarium, and most of the people I've talked to, their first time visiting a planetarium was as a child on a school field trip. And you'd be surprised if quite a few people never get an opportunity to go back to a planetarium until they're an adult and they have kids and they take them to a planetarium. How many of you have been to the Hayden Planetarium in this area? Okay. How many of you have been to a planetarium other than the Hayden? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I've always wanted to do a, a planetarium tour and make a t-shirt of oh. all the planetariums I visited. That would be, be cool. cool. Yeah. Like so. a concert tour except yeah. for planetariums. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay, you can All right. advance to the next one. Now, often movies can inspire you to go into space. So recently, we had three movies that would inspire people to be astronauts. Well, Gravity, probably not, because if you saw Gravity, they really should have called that trap. <laughs> but Interstellar and The Martian, uh, both were movies that talked about what would it be like several years from now, because my son, who's six years old now, he will be the same age as Mark Watney was in the movie, or he is the same age, well, by that time, he'll be that age, he'll be in his 30s. Uh, and Interstellar talks about how we could potentially go to another star system using the physics that we understand today. So, uh, and then the gravity thing, eh, well. Yeah. But it yeah, was a cool I, movie, the special effects. Yeah, were either shrapnel but. or inertia. I think that was yeah. the other thing it should have been called. But anyway, yeah, and uh, putting stuff in the same orbit, uh, <laughs> very close to each other, is not. So yeah, I, I think we do, uh, I don't know if you guys do this, but when we see movies, sometimes the, the science distracts us, you know, the, uh, the, the kind mm -hmm. of science. And, and luckily, uh, I, for all of these, I can kind of turn off that part of my brain yeah. and say, yeah, oh, I that would to. never have happened. Oh yeah. my gosh, yeah, right. <laughs> if they would have tied down the rocket better, it would have <laughs> blown over. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. we got these movies, and then we also got those movies that um, maybe... <laughs> Oh, Pluto Nash, that was yeah, the other was one the that other. I was going to, oh yeah, anybody see Pluto Nash? It was on like Star 64 the other week, and mm. it was bad, it was pretty bad. Yeah, some movies <laughs> might make you not want to go into space. But. <laughs> okay, well, I had, I had a video of this, but um, videos and images from NASA can really inspire. One of the ones that recently uh, I saw and I shared it on my Facebook page was the image of, a close-up image that Cassini took of the hexagon at the North Pole of Saturn. And that hexagon is actually produced by a phenomenon called Rossby waves, which is a jet stream pattern that happens on planets. But particularly on Saturn, the planet itself rotates so much faster in the atmosphere that it causes eddies that make little pinch-off points that form a hexagon. And in this picture, uh, they, they showed a little storm, a little cyclonic storm in the hexagon. And that storm was bigger than the entire state of Texas. Hmm. Don't tell Texas that. <laughs> Texas is a crowd. So, um, Whoop, there we go. Okay, so Hubble pictures and pictures from Cassini, as I mentioned before, can also inspire. Because that picture of Saturn from the nighttime side, of course, we've never seen that before, and we can't see it from Earth. But when we send robot probes out there, we can catch images and vistas of the planets that we could only imagine uh, before. And the Hubble images, I'm, I'm really excited about the James L. Webb telescope uh, eventually being. Uh, deployed. Yeah, we only have a few more months of the Cassini mission also. I mean, it's been there since 2004, but it's going to end September of this year when they're finally going to crash it into the planet. Um, so we only have a few more months to get these amazing pictures of Saturn because it's, we're not going to have anything around orbiting Saturn for a long time. There's nothing on the books. So yeah. uh, I'm really, that was my favorite mission is the Cassini mission. And uh, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the hexagon yeah, part of mm -hmm. it too. Okay, so one of the other opportunities we have is the best thing we can do to uh, interest young people, or anyone for that matter, in astronomy is to show them something interesting. And when I, uh, when I was about 18 years old, that was when Halley's Comet came by. And how many of you saw Halley's Comet? Yeah, so, uh, so you know, it was, it was hyped up because it's, our, it's kind of humanity's comet. Every, it comes by every 76 years or so. So my great aunt, she saw it in 1910 when she was 10 years old, and she got a chance to see it again in 1985. And of course, my mom, who had never seen it, she was like really excited about it. I was like, oh, when is it going to get here? When is it going to get here? So uh, we, because we live in Miami, there are a lot of street lights, so we drove down to Homestead, where it was a little bit darker. And I had the telescope set up, uh, aimed at Halley's Comet, and she looked through the telescope, and she said, and I quote, that's it? Because she sees all these pictures and she thinks, expects this big flaming thing in the sky. I said, well, Mom, it's really just a ball of rock and ice, and the ice is melting, and it creates a little atmosphere, and sun's w solar wind blows the tail back, and it's on the opposite side of the solar system, unfortunately, so it was very dim. 
So to salvage the moment, I said, well, Saturn is up. And coincidentally, Saturn is in the same spot in the sky as it was 30 years ago, because it takes 30 years for Saturn to go around again, because Scorpius and Sagittarius are right there. So I aimed it at Saturn, and she looked through the telescope and said, oh my gosh, you can see the rings. I said, well, yeah, Mom, it's a telescope. <laughs> but then I realized, no, 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 don't, no, don't say that, because Mom will slap you. Right. Um, <laughs> right. But yeah, so a lot of people don't realize that when you look at that dot, that bright, because most people don't realize you can see the planets as bright dots in the sky. And when you aim a telescope, you can actually resolve the rings, or the moons of Saturn, or depending on the size of your telescope, you can see the great red spot. So is that on the next slide or no? No, uh, okay. no a little later. Okay. But, so, yeah. okay. so, but things that, um, when you have an opportunity to share an astronomical event with folks, because sometimes we'll do sidewalk astronomy, and we'll talk later on about a couple of events that I've done at our planetarium with our local schools. Uh, and when little kids, when they look at Venus through the telescope, we did that uh, about a month or so ago, uh, the kids would look at Venus and its crescent and say, oh, look, it's the moon. It's like, no, because the moon wasn't up, unfortunately, <laughs> otherwise I would have shown the moon. But when they see Venus looking like the crescent moon, it's, you, you don't want to dampen their enthusiasm and say, well, that's not the moon, that's actually a planet. But you say, well, Venus, the way it is right now, it looks a lot like the moon. And so, but at least they're associating it with something that they're familiar with. And so this is the, the trap that maybe you've fallen into if you're, if you're an astronomy educator or an astronomy club, is that there's events that get hyped in the media, like a comet or a meteor shower, and then you go out there with the public and the public is yeah. disappointed. Yeah. They're like, oh, well, that was it. I heard there's going to be 100 meteors per hour. And there was like And two. I saw two. Or the converse of that is what we used to call the Horkheimer effect. And the Horkheimer effect is like Murphy's Law uh, for astronomy. It's basically the probability of cloud cover is directly proportional to the awesomeness of the event you're trying to show people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, and we jokingly named it, Jack named it after himself, because like, we would publicize things. So, for example, the transit of Venus that happened back in 2012, you know, we're hyping it, hyping it, and in Florida, we were able to see it just before sunset, but if you've ever been to Florida, weather in Florida in June, it's really nice and sunny in the morning, and then you get thunderstorms in the afternoon. So, we had 300 people at the planetarium, and just as the... Uh, transit was about to happen, we had storm clouds bill up and it started pouring down rain. So we all went inside the planetarium and fortunately for the internet, we had video feeds from SLU and a couple other uh, uh, observation points. It seems like Arizona has the best weather. Arizona and New Mexico, they're all, which is why they put observatories. <laughs> That's right. But uh, they had a, an image of the transit. So when I got home later on that evening, my son was two years old at the time. I was telling him, hey, that's Venus transiting the sun. And of course, he didn't really know what was going on. But he'll be, I don't know, he, probably, uh, he might live to see the next one. Well, yeah. 100, uh, 100, 100 years from 117, today. 117, yeah. 100 years yeah, from now. 100, yeah, maybe. So, well, so yeah, you want to, that's the trap, is you want to publicize your events, but you want to make sure you have something good to actually show them. Mm -hmm. So, the big one. You got something. The big one. <laughs> now, I yeah. mean, comets, who knows what's going to happen with the comet? Meteor showers, who knows what's going to happen with meteor shower? This is something you know is going to happen, and it's going to wow your crowd. This is, this is going to be huge. I can't underestimate this. I can't underemphasize this. This is going to be so big, the media is going to be all over this. Yes. And so what we want to encourage you to do is to use this moment to your advantage. Because if you're an astronomy club or if you're uh, just an astronomy enthusiast, the media is going to need your help. Because they, how do I put this delicately? <laughs> they need your help. They just need your help. <laughs> and to explain something to them that they can understand. <laughs> no, boy, I'm really putting it, I'm, I'm yeah. digging it deeper. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> the way that you can put it to them to help them understand things, that they can communicate then to, uh, the, to their Accurate. audience, this is really yeah. important. And because this is going to be uh, so huge, this is going to be uh, all around for that whole week and probably even the month ahead of time because mm -hmm. this hasn't happened in the United States in 30 year, 38 years, at least in the mainland U.S. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be visible from coast to coast mm -hmm. and everybody in the U.S. will at least get to see a partial clip. So it's a story for the entire country. Uh, now, I, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. This is a slide from one of my early PowerPoints when I first started at the observatory. And I showed this to kids. I said, oh, there's going to be a total eclipse. Like, 
this is like pretend this is the year 2001. And I said, there's going to be a solar eclipse in a short period of time. Uh, 2017, 2024, and 2045. 2045, yeah. And that was a good joke. But now, it's almost here. I can't wait. This is yeah. something we've been looking forward to for a long time. So yeah. we have to really share this with as many people as possible. I'm, I'm already promoting the 2045 <laughs> eclipse because that one goes through not only where I was born, Denver, Colorado, but Centerline is also the entire state of Florida. And it goes over where my mom was born, Nassau, in the Bahamas. And the moon is going to be at perigee on that eclipse. So it's going to have a, between a five and a seven minute totality, which is one of the best solar eclipses in the 21st century. And it's two weeks before my 78th birthday. That's right. Yay. And so James and I are planning to be in our retirement homes there together to watch it from South Florida. What do you say? Yes, that works. Well. All right, all right. Um, we'll probably still be doing stargazers. Maybe we'll be. <laughs> then we'll definitely call it stargazers, that's for sure. <laughs> So uh, here's what, uh, what I recommend, is that um, if you're in a club or even you know, if you want to promote your, promote your organization, definitely approach the media. Make, uh, make the first contact. Introduce yourself. Say, we got this event coming up. If you have any questions about it, I'm the guy to talk to. Let, let us know. We'd be happy to help uh, because there's going to be some, you know, have to figure out when the timing is, how much it's going to be blocked from where you live all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so just making an introduction would be very good. And I mm -hmm. highly recommend talking to the weather people. They yeah. are the scientists of the news. And mm -hmm. so you really need to make your friends with the weather people. Oh, is Joe Rao out there? Sorry, Joe. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's yeah. a weatherman and an, an astronomer. astronomer. So, yeah. so not only can he sacrifice a goat to get the eclipse to end, maybe he can do something about making clouds disappear. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But whether, whether the meteorologists really love astronomy, I, I've never met an, a meteorologist who doesn't like talking astronomy. And so if you yeah. can get in good with them and that they know who you are and can, you know, can make contact mm -hmm. with them, th that's a really good way to do it. You know, offer them your expertise, offer them, uh, and then offer them a program. Uh, get the, uh, the the news to come out and do a program, or just have them invite them over to show through the telescope, yeah. or bring a telescope to the studio. Even better, that's a great yeah. way to do it. Or collaborate with your local planetarium to see if you can partner with. Oh, oh yeah. Oh shoot, no, that's that one. Yeah, yeah there it is. <laughs> yeah, so, um, because when I started working at the planetarium in Gainesville, uh, I was called. I started working there in October of 2009, and just shortly after that. It was a Leonid meteor shower, and I got a phone call from our local television station saying, hey, we want to come out and do an interview about the meteor shower. And I thought, oh, wow, I'm now the Jack Horkheimer for Gainesville. <laughs> because when I was younger and I went to summer camp, there was an opportunity where I, and this was before I started working at the planetarium, I saw uh, Channel 4 visit the planetarium in Miami, and Jack was there doing an interview in the lobby. I thought, wow, that's really cool. He gets to go on TV and talk about stuff. And then when I went home later on that night, I actually saw what they recorded. So anyway, when, uh, when the media contacted me, I realized, OK, that I need to be uh, ready to talk uh, either on television or on the radio when it comes to uh, astronomical events. So you can be the Jack Horkheimer of your particular uh, region or your neighborhood. Depending oh, yeah. On I mean, every, every city really needs this. I mean, because this isn't something that the, the professors and universities do, well, do like to do, I yeah. guess. And some people don't communicate as well as... Right. And, and that's what the, the TV folks told us. So, oh, well, we used to always call the University of Cincinnati, but now we can talk to, to you. And, and so uh, they really need that. That's the thing. They are, they're looking for it. And this event is going to be perfect for that. Uh, and so, uh, and then you can also like try to spread the word through through teachers. Uh, in Cincinnati, at least, August 21st is going to be a school day. Yeah, it's, it's a our Monday, first day of school too. and a lot of people are back in school. And we're at the range where it's only 90% blocked in mm -hmm. Cincinnati. So we're trying to educate the teachers that, oh man, they're stuck there. The poor kids yeah. and you know, teachers have to be stuck there. And so we want to educate them on how to see the see the sun safely. And one, yeah, one of the things that our Planetarium Association is doing is we're ordering uh, a lot of eclipse glasses. Uh, and we're going to distribute them in our respective communities to the schools so that the teachers at certain schools have the glasses, because the kids will be getting out of school for us just the, the maximum part of the eclipse. So uh, you can do that in your communities. And the nice thing about the eclipse glasses, is you can put branding on it that advertises your astronomy club or your observatory or planetarium. 
Uh, yeah, and I think getting early, getting the, yeah. the word out early is good because I, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, this tragic story that I heard from the 90s when there was uh, a, a, a annular eclipse, almost a total eclipse around Ohio, is that the principals basically canceled recess. So they said, we don't want you going out there and getting blind. So instead, recess is canceled. And so nobody inside. saw the eclipse in like almost the whole state of Ohio. I mean, it was like tragic to hear this. Yeah. Like, or you could educate the teachers to look at safely and wow yeah. the kids. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, and so yeah. that's what we want to try to get in front of this and try to, to get the word out a little bit more. And uh, the key thing is that you, you probably will want to wow them ahead of time. Uh, you'll want to wow them by bringing scopes to them and showing them views of the sun, safe mm -hmm. views of the sun, put a solar filter on things, or just host star parties at night for them too and, and show them really interesting stuff like the moon in a telescope or, or Saturn in a telescope or something like that. Um, so you could outfit your uh, historic observatory with a solar filter, look at the sun, uh, take telescopes out to places and uh, observe the sun there. This is with a, a H alpha filter on a, on a scope that we took to a school. Uh, and then uh, getting telescopes in the hands of people is always good because that's what it, it feels like so many people have not ever looked through a telescope. And when mm. you show them that, you introduce them for the first time, it's just the, the feeling you get back is just incredible. So these are some telescopes that we uh, awarded. These are those Galileo scopes. Uh, and these kids like were so excited. They're like looking at the moon and then they're like showing it to everybody else that passes by. And so a lot of you are, are probably in astronomy clubs and you have a lot of people that you can, you can work with and have a lot of people that get out there and mobilize to, to do this. And this, this, could, this moment uh, of the eclipse could be a way to either boost your own numbers in your, your club or start a whole new era, really, of, of having new members in, in your astronomy club because this is going to be such a widespread thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then you can also travel to places because, well, I'm not going to stay in Cincinnati for a 90% eclipse. And <laughs> yeah, I'm going to try to see totality myself. So, so uh, uh, Kentucky, getting mobile Tennessee. and getting out there and, and joining some other star parties is good. Uh, uh, the annual eclipse that happened in 2012, I went out to Reno, uh, Nevada, and had a really cool, uh, cool sight to, to see. Uh, this was uh, the star party there where they had a few thousand people that were set up. And it was sunny. <laughs> well, most of the time. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so you could get to these uh, star parties and get out there. And uh, so I definitely encourage you to not settle for 90% eclipse. I'd say get out there and see as much as you can. Uh, and then you could also do some star parties in, in advance to this, uh, like uh, this one. What yeah. was this one? Yeah, this one we did a uh, star party uh, as part of uh, first one was Night of Stars over at uh, Duval Elementary, uh, sorry, Duval Early Learning Academy in Gainesville. And we did one the following week, and this was in February over at Irby Elementary where my son happens to go to school, and that, that's my son. Um, interesting thing about your children and uh, what they, when they see you do things, they want to do the same thing. So, and we even cut our hair the same way, oddly enough. But, <laughs> and cloning works. But yeah. So, but uh, yeah, it was funny. He knew all his planets by the time he was like two years old. And I said, "Wow, it's a good thing I don't work at a liquor store." Because <laughs> he knew all his planets. So, but um, yeah. So the telescope we had, um, our planetarium has been blessed with. Uh, donors who will donate telescopes to us. So one of our students, he donated his Celestron Nexstar to us because he said, I, you know, I live out in the country, but I never really had time to set it up and, and operate it properly. So he donated it to us. So we've, it's a lot more portable than our 12-inch Schmidt Cassegrain uh, to take with us. So we carry that, and that's the one that the students look through. And uh, so I first lined it up with Venus while it was daytime. Because a lot of people don't realize that you can see some of the planets in the daytime. Uh, I showed a couple of our professors Venus uh, just in the sky, because as Venus was coming around as a crescent, we, uh, we got to see it. So having the kids uh, look through the telescope. And how many of you actually have done star parties yourselves? Okay. Have you ever noticed that when kids, particularly younger ones, who are, I guess, younger than six years old, when they get up to the telescope, they immediately want to touch the eyepiece? It's like, no, I just aligned it. Oh, yeah, I heard a groan <laughs> out there, yeah. <laughs> oh. 
we should write a, a top 10 list, top 10 things that often happen at star parties. So. <laughs> All right. So, Did, have you heard the uh, the 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 trick to to stopping that? Oh, what is it? I've seen this in the faction. Is you get a walker, like uh, you know, mm -hmm. nursing home walker, and mm -hmm. you put it right in front of the telescope. And so when the kids go up to lean in, they put their hands on the walker, uh -huh. and then look, at, and then huh. no moving telescope, Ooh. except for then they're like, what's that? And then it's, uh, <laughs> it's gone. But yeah. Yeah, because like with my ladder, you see how the kid. Uh, oh yeah, see the, the ladder, ladder does yeah. it too. Perfect, mm -hmm. perfect. Ooh, pretty. Uh, so in the, uh, I also, you know, we're going to be talking about, you know, talking about this eclipse as being such a giant thing, but let's not forget some of the other wow moments. And, and I've kind of come back to Saturn again, because I, I know uh, probably a lot of you have seen Saturn over and over and over again. Um, and it, the, what I always think of is the first time I saw Saturn a telescope. Mm -hmm. When I first got this really cheap telescope and I pointed at Saturn and I found it myself, and I was just like, I, I still remember that so well, that that was this moment in my life. And so I, we're going to have Saturn up during the summertime, right mm -hmm. before the eclipse. And so I'd really highly encourage using that to, to, to show people, because Saturn, it's going to be at its most tilt, tilted for uh, its cycle, and it mm -hmm. wows the crowds every time, yeah. guaranteed, guaranteed. And Jupiter was my first... Uh planetary experience. Uh, I purchased a telescope when I was about, well, I purchased my own telescope when I was 18, but I got one as a gift when I was 13, so the first planet I want to look at is Jupiter, because in Sky and Telescope, not only do they show you, they show you the positions of the moons every night. So I looked through my telescope on the particular night, and the moons were right there, and the next night I'd say the moons had shifted. And that made a huge impression on me, that you could see the moons of another planet uh, through just the modest telescope. Yeah, and I, I think Saturn is one of those things, and Jupiter, mm -hmm. Jupiter also is just that uh, I, I, I wrote a, an article for Sky and Telescope about Saturn and kind of my relationship with it, and it's, it's you know, I've been doing this for you know, almost 20 years, and, and it, it's, sometimes you forget about what it was that inspired you in the first place, and Saturn was definitely that thing for me, and uh, just to take the time... It, it seems like, oh, well, we're going to look at Saturn again. But for somebody that's never seen through a telescope, mm -hmm. I'm still shocked at how few people have actually looked through a telescope before. And they come to the observatory for the first time and look through a scope and see this. It's, it's, it, it's something not to, be, uh, not to be glossed over, that's for sure. And then uh, another way that I found it's really good to engage folks is using their technology. Um, is you get the telescope, you point it at the moon, mm -hmm. and I don't know, have you gotten this? What do people want to do? They want take, to a picture. take a picture. There you go. Phone. You got it right there. They want to take a picture at the cell phone. And, of course, this is, is always easy. frustrating to the people in line. They're like, oh, oh. another picture it's through like, the telescope. And I, I can barely, I, and they try, and it's, it's not easy to do, right. unless you have a mount for it, like yeah. they did in the Celestron commercial. And this one, this was just one that somebody held up to our telescope. Of course, it was through the observatory telescope, 11-inch refractor with a 2-inch eyepiece. But still, <laughs> uh, but still, letting people have a, a picture that they can take home with them uh, is is really powerful because they're gonna they're gonna you know keep it. They're gonna tweet about it. They're gonna mm -hmm. yeah. what else do they do? Yeah, per well, personalizes the, the moment. Snapchat. Them, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Well, what's the other one? Uh, well, Twitter. Instagram. They'll tweet it or Instagram. It. I don't know what yeah. those are called. So. <laughs> But, but yeah, it, I, I Instagrammed the first photo that I took through our telescope, and I was like, wow, because my cell phone, I, it's not easy to, to line it up properly. Uh, but when you do, and you can actually capture it, it's quite a, an amazing thing. Yeah, and I, I, I think just that, that's where kind of things are going, is that the more and more people that, that come to the observatory, they want a picture, and it's, uh, it's a great marketing tool for your group too. You get get that out there, you get people uh, talking about it. Uh, it's really pretty cool. So uh, so I'm not sure, oh, speaking of Arizona, this is uh, Arizona. I went out to uh, Sedona to see a few things. I saw the transit of Venus and a, a partial eclipse out there. And uh, I would say definitely get uh, hooked up with other clubs. Uh, this is, it, it, kind of boggles my mind whenever I travel somewhere and I want to you know m meet other astronomers or I want to hook up with other clubs it is so easy if you know where you're you're going just send an email to an astronomy club and they are the most friendly welcoming folks 
Uh, I mean, uh, it was this this guy in uh, Sedona had his. Uh, he was the president of the v astronomers of the Verde Valley, and uh, he invited me to his house uh, to view the transit. I mean, he doesn't know who I am, and he just invited me. He's like, oh, he's another astronomer. Come on over. And uh, we came to his house. Now, of course, he was a little uh, into it. He had a separate structure with four permanently mounted telescopes yeah. mounted in a slide-off roof and uh, yeah, camera equipment and stuff like that. And, and his wife let him. That's yeah. it. So it, it, it worked out. It worked out. So that and photography are one of the two uh, hobbies that can get quite pricey. Yeah. Yeah. But so if you are going to travel for the eclipse, definitely hook up with some other astronomy clubs because I, I've found all, universally, I have, there's no exceptions, all of them have been so great and welcoming. It's like we're kind of a brotherhood. Yeah. It's like mm -hmm. the astronomers. Whether Either that or misery loves company. Oh, you know, maybe that's what it is. <laughs> that's right. And so it's always but. great to have, uh, have them doing that. And, and, and there's James. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, so what, what's your, your, where are you going to go for the eclipse? Well, uh, our astronomy, uh, the Southeastern Planetarium uh, Association, we, we've, uh, we booked a block of hotel rooms for ourselves in Kentucky. So we're going to try to all meet there for that eclipse. Uh, and it's in a resort that's in the center line for the oh, eclipse. Cool. Um, and my, uh, my colleague who I work with, she said she's okay with manning the planetarium that day while I go. And it's the first day of classes, so one of our astronomy professors uh, begged the department chair, can I please go and we'll start class the next day. It's, it's weird. I almost want to ask the college president to, if we could push the first day of class to the 22nd, not the 21st. But, you know. <sighs> yeah, I already uh, put in my notice that I'm not going to be there that day. That's going to be a problem is that I don't know if anybody's going to be at the observatory on the eclipse day. <laughs> or we might yeah. be closed. That's one of the challenges know. of solar eclipses because those of us who are in the know about it, we want to actually see it ourselves. Yeah. But yeah. if you don't live in a city that's on center line, yeah. So it's, uh, it's do I want to be, because you really want to be there to educate the people, but you also want to see it yourself. Yeah. So. Yeah. We, we definitely want to encourage you guys to use this moment. Use this to uh, really inspire a lot of folks. Build your club. Uh, and make some connections with the media that it's going to last after the eclipse because there's always going to be more stories. We're always going to have more things that are going to be in the, the news. And if they know who you are and where you are, they will definitely get in touch with you. Uh, and so uh, we want to leave you guys with our parting shots. Here is uh, Jack and the crew. Well, a lot of the, well, a lot of the crew is still there with the show, actually. And there they are doing their keep looking up symbol. And I found uh, this one here. Mm -hmm. uh, here's the Jack's one. And there he is. Keep looking up. There he is. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you guys very much for having us today. Thank you.
about your life. Awesome! We can take a picture of it too. 